tell us more, please join me in welcoming Rob Brunner. Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I appreciate that. And thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I, if you don't mind, I want this conversation to actually be a conversation. So I'm going to do my best to tell the story of the Atlanta Beltline, what it is, where it's going, how we got there. Uh, my, my goal is not to come here and say, you all need to be Atlanta. I would never wish that on you. Um, I, did, okay, I, lo I love Atlanta, but it's, you know, that's, that's not my role here. My, my uh, role is to help you all understand how we believe the Atlanta Beltline is transforming our city and in the process hopefully inspire you know, some creative thinking and ideas for how this can be, be helpful for you all. If you don't mind, if some of you are not too shy, if you could let me know a few things that you hope to get from today so I can be sure that I'm mindful of that as I'm, I'm speaking. So is anybody willing to share why you decided to show up today? Anybody? <laughs> okay, well then I assume you just want to hear me talk. Uh, <laughs> I, I will encourage you please to uh, ask questions throughout so there will be Q&A at the end but certainly if there's anything that either piques your interest or is unclear as we go uh, please just raise your hand. I'd, I'd prefer this to be interactive, if, if at all possible. So the Atlanta Beltline is uh, absolutely the most comprehensive and, and inspirational project going on in Atlanta. It is certainly the biggest undertaking that, that we've ever done as a city. Uh, some people actually compare it to the Olympics. Uh, so as you all know, Atlanta hosted the Olympics in 96. That was kind of our introduction to the world stage. And while the Olympics really kind of changed the trajectory for the city, the Olympics, in a lot of ways, was for the rest of the world. And the Atlanta Beltline is really for the people who live in Atlanta. Certainly, we welcome visitors. We encourage them to use it. But at the end of the day, it's, it's helping people in Atlanta move around the city, connect uh, with the city. And, and it's been recognized uh, by some as the most important rail trail project in the country, if not the world. And that is praise that we are humbled by. Um, it's not praise usually that Atlanta gets because as mi most people know us as the poster child for sprawl. Uh, but it's uh, certainly uh, Chris Leinberger is one of the preeminent um, landscape architects, uh, urban planners in the country. And, and to have this project be recognized as something that has the potential, and we have a lot to do to actually realize that potential, but at least have the potential to make Atlanta a more sustainable, <laughs> more walkable, uh, transit-oriented, transportation-focused city. How many of you all have been to Atlanta? Just show of hands. Okay, so some decent familiarity. Great. Uh, so Atlanta, uh, you can see here, these are the, the city limits of Atlanta. We are within Fulton County with a little piece in DeKalb County. Uh, but Atlanta is, as a city, about 450, between 450, 500,000 people in a metro region that has over 5 million. So relative to the region, it's actually only about 10% of the city's population, or the region's population. Although we are seeing, um, as many cities are around the country, seeing a remigration or immigration of population back into the urban core. Atlanta is notorious for our traffic. Uh, there was a lot of white flight and sprawl that happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I think as the traffic congestion got worse, as bridges collapsed, which I think everybody uh, saw happened a, a couple months ago, uh, it, fewer people want to be spending most of their time in the cars. And so they're looking for more walkable, more uh, you know, al alternate modes of transportation and living closer to their job centers. The Atlanta Beltline is kind of this uh, highlighted circle here. It's a 22-mile loop. It's fully located within the city of Atlanta and it's fully located within the uh, Fulton County portion of Atlanta. So from a, you know, for this group, I think it's probably relevant, we need to work with the city of Atlanta government and the Fulton County government, but we're not having to work, at least from a regulatory standpoint, with the other counties in the region. This is a, a kind of zoom in of the Beltline. So the Beltline is being, as John said, taking uh, old railroad corridors, and it's important to kind of understand Atlanta's history and the infrastructure because every city and region is going to have its own assets and kind of its own context in which infrastructure projects like the Beltline are built. So for those who, who may not know, Atlanta is actually exists, it came into being because of railroads. Unlike most other cities, including Knoxville, 
we don't have a major waterway, right? Most cities in the U.S. and really around the world are built on some sort of water source. Atlanta was built because railroads wanted to get around the Appalachians, and the railroads came together in a place that was called Terminus, and out of that grew the city. And historically, uh, as Atlanta became a transportation hub for rail traffic, it started to grow, and it got very congested for the railroads. And they decided that rather than coming all the way into town, they wanted to start bypassing the congestion that was existing in, in downtown at the time. And this is over, you know, over 100 years ago. And so they started building belt lines, right? And that was you know, multiple railroads that came in, and they'd say, well, we want to get down here, and another one wanted to go here, and one wanted to come up here. And they were built as bypasses, but they never connected, right? There were ways to, to get past the city, but it, it wasn't a continuous loop. So part of the Beltline project is to connect these four or five different rail segments into one continuous 22-mile loop, and in those corridors, place transit, trails, connect parks, connect communities, uh, as well as investments in affordable housing, in public art, and environmental uh, remediation. As you can imagine, there are many, many decades of uh, industry that happened well before there were environmental regulations. So there's a lot of uh, soil and stuff that needs to be cleaned up. But the vision for the Beltline is to connect all of this. And Atlanta, and I don't, I don't know uh, Knoxville's history, but Atlanta is a city that is separated, frankly, or has been historically separated by highways that cut off neighborhoods, cut through communities, by the rail lines themselves. So as the, as the city grew, you know, when these belt lines were built, they were out in the far reaches and the, you know, the suburbs where industry thought population would never go. Well, the reality is we've, transportation modes changed, highways got built, industry moved farther out, populations grew, grew out over the belt lines, and a lot of these had fallen into, into disuse. But they still connect, or they sorry, they still had disconnected neighborhoods, right? Literally the other side of the tracks. You'd have neighborhoods grow up to the rails, separated by the rails, and then new neighborhoods on the other side. So Atlanta's been separated by physically highways, rail lines. It's been separated racially, uh, socioeconomically. And we just haven't been a very integrated city, historically, despite being the city too busy to hate and, and frankly, doing a lot of very good things as it relates to uh, race relations. But still, if you look at um, income lines across the city, Atlanta has one of the greatest disparities when it comes to income inequality. The belt line is coming in and connecting the city in ways that we've never been connected. Right? It's connecting the city physically, right? So by taking these 22 miles and connecting some of the highest income neighborhoods to some of the lowest income neighborhoods, it's connecting us economically, right? So giving people access to job centers and kind of physically bringing, bringing the city together. It goes under or over many of the highways that had divided the city because the railroads were there first. And it's also, in a lot of ways, creating the, or connecting the city culturally, right? Through kind of the shared experience, creating public spaces where people can come together and at a very personal level connect with their neighbor, right? And get to know others around the city. The, uh, the planning area, so there's a lot of planning that has to go into this, right? At its, at its core, you've got the 22 mile loop, but the planning area is actually 15,000 acres, so a half mile on either side of this, and there was a, a giant um, you know, planning effort that looks at land use, looks at street connectivity. Uh, you've got over 20% of the city's population that lives within that half mile of the belt line. So there's a lot of intentionality to how, to how the belt line's built, being built out, and I can uh, speak to that more in a little bit. So the, the components of the belt line, right, it's built around this, this framework of the uh, historic rail corridors, but it includes transit, it includes trails, it includes new parks, it includes investments in affordable housing, public art, historic preservation, but it's also very much a economic development project, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this is intended to drive 10 to 20 billion dollars of new private economic development within that planning area. It is very much intended to create permanent jobs, 
up to 30,000, as well as tens of thousands of construction jobs. So one of the, as I've had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time in, in Knoxville since I got in yesterday and, and spoken with some of you all, um, you know, one of the things that I would encourage you to look at is not just, well, what's, what's the trail that we're building or what are the transportation corridors, but how does that relate to how we want the city to develop? Because right? at the end of the day, you're trying to use projects like this to connect people to economic development, to housing, to jobs, and you, need, you can't do them in isolation. Right? Or I, would, I would suggest that you not think about them in isolation, that you think about how the development that's happening in Knoxville can be enhanced and how you can move people in and throughout Knoxville using infrastructure, whatever the appropriate infrastructure is, is for you all. And so that's, that's really core to uh, the Beltline as a, as a project. There's been a lot of very uh, positive results so far uh, with the Beltline. So there's been, uh, to date, or through the end of last year, $3.7 billion of new private development that's happened within that half mile of the Beltline. So today we've invested about $450 million into the project itself with a return of nearly uh, $4 billion. So about an 8 to 1 return on investment when you look at the, you know, the funding that's been put into the Beltline and what it has helped to, to spur. Uh, this uh, particular picture here, you've got uh, one of our parks, historic Fourth Ward Park, that I'll talk a little bit about later. But this building here was an old uh, Sears distribution facility, built in the 1920s. Uh, Sears had sold it to the city in the 70s. It really went into, frankly, an unused state. It flooded. This park uh, helped to solve the flooding issue, so kind of a marriage of uh, water, watershed management and parks to help activate uh, this building that was then developed by Jamestown Properties, which has uh, developed Chelsea Market in New York, as well as many other developments. Also, all these apartments uh, that you see around the park were not there five or ten years ago. Great question. I don't have, uh, what I have heard actually is that typically you get more about a three or four to one if, if the investments are done well, right? So there's certainly plenty of investments that don't generate a return on, you know, return because they're not done in a thoughtful manner, but I think just a good project typically is about three to four, three or four to one. Um, and, and just in, in transparency, the, the parts of the Beltline that have been built so far have been built in some of the areas that were kind of most ripe for development. So I wouldn't necessarily expect that we continue to see that level of return throughout the full 25 year implementation, but we still expect it to be quite robust. Better health. Right? Atlanta is becoming healthier. You see people now biking to work. They walk to get their groceries. They exercise in parks. They choose bike and pedestrian just getting around the city instead of cars. And that has had a very meaningful uh, impact. We've had 1.7 million users of the East Side Trail, which is about a two and a quarter uh, mile section that opened up uh, a few years ago, but 1.7 million people a year using that, that trail. It's just fundamentally transforming the way that Atlantans move around the city. Atlanta is also, as, as I mentioned, seeing an in-migration or return uh, of people living in the city. Some people project that Atlanta's population could triple uh, by, by 2040. And so building the transportation infrastructure that is going to support that growth is critical. So that includes uh, transit, which is a, a key piece to it, as well as the, the trail infrastructure. This is a uh, old state farmer's market, so a historic building that's uh, going to eventually be redeveloped. And you can see kind of the remembering that this used to be freight lines, right? So this is where uh, industry would have their loading docks. But you can you know, see how the vision is, and I've got some real pictures of things that have happened, where you know, patios, making, making the Beltline a front door, right? Where as businesses move in, I mean, businesses along the Beltline have seen four or five-fold increase just from the additional foot and pedestrian traffic that's been, uh, been going. So it's really reshaping that development and providing a way, in addition to cars, not instead of cars, but in addition to cars, uh, for people to move around the city. 
And then it also adds a, a level of cultural vibrancy. So this picture is of an annual event we have called the Lantern Parade. It kicks off a three-month uh, fall uh, exhibition for art on the Atlanta Beltline. And as you can make out here, there are tens of thousands of people. Last year we had over 70,000 uh, who many of them make their own homemade lanterns. This is a free event to the, for the public. It is like a family-friendly Mardi Gras. So you literally have kids and adults, you know, some just making a little globe and walking down uh, the, the trail. Others, I mean, the, the amount of creativity that goes into, you know, you've got the minions, you've got Pac-Man, you've got, <laughs> you know, birds and dragons and all this stuff. I mean, it is really uh, a festival and it's grown from, you know, the first year, I think there were maybe 200, 300 people in it. And as I said, last year, uh, seven years later, over 70,000. And that includes the people in the parade as well as all the, the folks alongside it. But it, it creates an opportunity. This is not just about, well, can people get from point A to point B, but how can you activate the infrastructure you have and the, the trail network to be something that makes Atlanta a more fun place to live, right? And it's, uh, this is very uniquely Atlanta, and it didn't exist before the, before the Beltline. And because we have this uh, because we have the East Side Trail now and, and Beltline Trails, we can do things like this. Although we can't advance slides, there we go. So th that's that's a little bit about so well, you know how's the Beltline changing the changing the city and generally for the better. Although you know there are challenges and I'll mm -hmm. I'll get into those. But I I do want to take a little bit of time to say well how how did we get here, right? There are plenty of Atlantans today who just think the Beltline happens. Right? They see it, they figure it out, well, that's great, we have a belt line. And even in Atlanta, uh, we, we haven't fully remembered the story of, of how we got here. And we wouldn't be here without a tremendous amount of community activism, grassroots support. Um, unlike, many, unlike many projects like this, uh, this actually started from a grassroots movement. Right? This wasn't the city government or the county government you know, saying we're going to do this to the residents of Atlanta. This was the residents of Atlanta advocating to their mayor, to their leadership, to improve uh, the, the public space and the transportation options. So as, as John mentioned, there was a, a thesis written in 1999 by this guy, uh, Ryan Gravel. Uh, he was a master's student at Georgia Tech, and he was looking at these rail corridors that circled the city. And he wasn't the first one to, to look at them. Uh, but what he, he had spent some time in Paris, he was inspired, he lost a lot of weight, he felt healthier, he's like, wow, I'm walking around a lot, you know, can't we do something like this in Atlanta? Because he had, he had grown up in the suburbs and was kind of that car commuting culture. And, you know, his thesis was basically that cities have a choice to build infrastructure that will shape certain types of development and they, depending on what choices they make about the infrastructure they build, the results will follow. Right? So Atlanta made a choice to really build out its highway system. Right? We've, we've got lots of lanes of highways in Atlanta, and they go really far out, and they do a great, well, they used to do a better job of moving people <laughs> to, from the, to the suburbs. At the time they were built, it was, I mean, it was really easy to go live in the suburbs, get into downtown quickly, and, you know, have a bigger lot, bigger house, you know, all that. And, and the result of that is we have sprawled. And now we are experiencing the longer term results of that, which is, well, if everybody does that, then you get a lot of congestion, right? So Ryan's uh, thesis was, well, let's, what if we were to build infrastructure and, and have land, uh, land use patterns that were more walkable, were more bike and pedestrian friendly, were denser, frankly, where more people could live in the city and travel shorter distances to get to work and to live their lives. And so his, his project actually started as a, or his thesis was based on transit. But then the thing that was uh, really exciting about it is that others started to be inspired by that vision of, of connecting the city and lots of layers got put on it. So Ryan graduated, he passed, it was a pass-fail thesis, uh, but he graduated, he went to work and he was actually working on a, a project that is now on the Beltline. And he was having a conversation with his coworkers. They were deciding, where do we put the parking garage in this, in this project? 
And the options were you put it up against this abandoned rail corridor that had kudzu that was chest high that a lot of homeless people lived in that you wouldn't want to be out there at, at night. You put the parking deck up against this abandoned rail corridor, which is typically what people would do, or do you put the parking deck kind of in the middle of the development, build around it, and have a front door to what could one day be this belt line? So he shared his idea for what this rail corridor could be. And his coworkers were fascinated. And they said, you, you've got to get this idea out there. And they helped him. And they wrote letters to the governor on down. And they got some responses, like, oh, that sounds good. Let us know how it works out. And good luck with that. Uh, but one person who really grabbed onto it was Kathy Woolard. So Kathy Woolard's there with Ryan. And at the time, she was uh, in city council. She was chair of the transportation committee. And she was really, really frustrated. So this is in the early 2000s. All the conversations were about getting people in and out of the city. And as a city council representative, she wasn't hearing anything about, well, what about the people who live here? How, how do we get around our city? And so when she saw Ryan's, you know, the letter that was written, she got really excited, reached out to Ryan, and they formed a group called Friends of the Beltline. And they started going literally neighborhood to neighborhood, telling people about this idea. And the, the energy grew. Uh, our mayor at the time, Mayor Franklin, you know, she'll tell you she could go to a public meeting. It did not matter what the topic was supposed to be about. Somebody in the audience was saying, when are you going to do the belt line? we got to do the belt line. Right? Kathy became city council president and, and really took the conversation uh, citywide. And Mayor Franklin, she had to deal with potholes. She had to deal with sewers. But she then took up the belt line, uh, tested the viability, and said, we got to do this. This is going to make our city better. And she turned uh, to the private sector. So the Atlanta Committee for Progress is an organization in Atlanta. It's made up of the top CEOs and uh, university presidents and philanthropic uh, foundations. And Mayor Franklin had, had brought them together as a council because in order for things to get done, you have to have the public sector and the private sector in alignment. Right? And so a number of initiatives had come out of the Atlanta Committee for Progress. She turned to them, and specifically to Ray Weeks, who was the, the founding chair of the Beltline Partnership, and said, we've got this idea. People love it. I think it's good for the city. We need leadership. Right? We, need some, we need somebody who can you know, help get this go from idea to, to reality. And Ray did just that. He was a, a developer, but a very civically minded one. And he retired for a few years. He put the Beltline on his back. Uh, Friends of the Beltline that Kathy and Ryan uh, had created literally became the Beltline Partnership, the organization that, that I now lead. And Ray was our founding, our founding chair. And they worked with the city to get the redevelopment plan adopted, the main funding mechanism set up for the Beltline, early philanthropic support to help advance the vision, and you know, ultimately set up the organization Atlanta Beltline Inc., which I'll talk about in a minute. But they're the ones who um, are responsible for building the Beltline. Also key, we're having uh, trusted partners in, in the early days. So the PATH Foundation, which is, uh, they've built over, I think, 250 miles of trails in Georgia, well-respected, uh, as well as the Trust for Public Land, uh, which is actually a national organization, but uh, they have a, a Georgia office. So the, path, the trail and park piece were kind of layered on to this original vision, as, as was public art, the need for affordable housing, Right, all this came out of the desires of the community, historic preservation, which Atlanta has a very bad history with historic preservation, um, but we're getting better. So all these things got embedded into the Beltline to help make it what it is now, a very comprehensive uh, project that's trying to address a lot of the needs in the city. I think you had a question. Did you raise your hand a minute ago? No? OK. So, the partnership was, was created. We got the project off the ground. The redevelopment plan was adopted. This is all in 2005, 2006. Uh, Boston Consulting Group actually gave over a million dollars of pro bono assistance to set up a work plan for the first five years. So we had the 25-year vision, but what were we going to do first? So they came in and helped. And we set up this, this organizational structure, which you all may be, may be interested in. So as I, as I mentioned, we've got Fulton County, City of Atlanta. You also see Atlanta Public Schools. So the, 
uh, main funding mechanism for the Atlanta Beltline is what we call in Georgia a tax allocation district. Uh, some sta most states, I think, call it tax increment financing, uh, which some of you all may be familiar with. But the basic concept is you know, a property is generating this amount of tax in year one. If you do something that's going to make the property more valuable, the property tax that you collect is going to go up. Right? And you use that increase in the property tax to help pay for whatever improvements you're doing. So the Beltline is a 6,500-acre tax allocation district. So all the properties within that district, they were making this amount of or generating this amount of tax revenue in 2005. They're appreciating. That's generating money that's being used to pay for the Beltline. And then at the end of 2030, when, the, when that tax allocation district expires, all of that revenue from that point forward goes to city, county, and public schools. So in, in Atlanta, you're, the property taxes we pay are divided between city, county, public schools. And so all three of these organizations needed to sign off and say, yes, we're willing to forego you know, increases in property tax revenue over the next 25 years to help pay for this because we think it's going to create stronger communities, more economic development, um, better quality of life. And at the end of that 25 years, they're going to have a lot more of a property tax base than they had at the beginning. There's, in Atlanta, we have a Invest Atlanta, which is the economic development authority uh, for the city. So they manage these tax allocation districts, including the Beltline. Uh, they do a lot of the work to try to attract businesses to Atlanta. Uh, so they, they kind of manage the money for this, but we set up Atlanta Beltline, Inc. as a uh, private, it's a nonprofit, it's not a 501c3, but it's a, incorporated as a nonprofit to be the implementation arm. So it was recognized that the skills, the expertise that are needed to plan and build a project like the Beltline did not exist in Invest Atlanta, and you needed an organization that was waking up every day, every day looking at the full, the big picture. There were discussions about, well, do you have the parks do their part, and you know, public works do their part, and everybody said, if you do that, it's going to get siloed. Nobody's going to see the big picture. You need an entity that's waking up every day focused on the project. So that's their role. And uh, my organization, Atlanta Beltline Partnership, we focus on uh, fundraising, advocacy, and work continuing to bring partners into the project to help support the communities around it. Um, so our mission's threefold. We raise philanthropic dollars we, to enable the project. We do all the programming uh, for the Beltline which helps to activate the parks and trails, as well as continue to maintain the advocacy and volunteerism and base of support for the project, as well as uh, what we call empowering the residents, so helping to bring partner organizations who are service providers into Beltline communities so that those residents actually benefit from the uh, investments that are being made in infrastructure. Yeah, and this, this, yes. And that makes it unique from all the other tax allocation districts in Atlanta. So Atlanta has 10. The other nine are exactly what you described, which tend to be development incentives to spur development. The, the paradigm or the theory here is, well, if you build infrastructure that people want to live and work around, that the development will follow, right? And so in this case, it's investing in that infrastructure. There is some amount of uh, the money that is used to help spur development in markets that are not ready yet to, to try to help catalyze that because there are some, you know, if you, there are a few areas where that's needed, but the vast majority is going into building the infrastructure. And so far, it's played out. How big is that district? It's uh, 6,500 acres, and it's easier on the map. So on this, the the orange is the tax allocation district. And you say, wow, that looks very gerrymandered. And the reason for it is that it's intentionally drawn to capture the industrial properties, right? If you remember, these used to be, you know, there used to be freight, you know, rail going through here. So there was a lot of industrial uses that fell into abandonment and disuse. And so it was intentionally drawn to capture those properties that were primed to be redeveloped and intentionally did not capture like single family homes. Right, so the, the idea is the properties they're going to redevelop help to fund the, the project. 
All right. So this is just a, a summary of the two organizations that I've already talked about. But the other key piece here is partnerships, right? So you don't, you know, at least in Atlanta, we would not be able to do an Atlanta Beltline even with two organizations focused on it, right? It, if you're gonna, for us, if you're gonna do something like this, you have to have partnerships at the federal, state, local level, nonprofit partners, um, you know, philanthropic partners. So we've, we've got a lot of different people who contribute to deliberating on the Beltline vision in different ways. So I'm gonna pause for a second because I've kind of described what the Beltline is, how we got here. I was gonna just start showing you pictures of kind of what's been done to hopefully help you get your, you know, get your mind around and, and see some of the results. But before I do that, are there any questions about anything that I've, I've covered so far? Yeah. No. And a great question. So MARTA, for those who don't know, is, is our regional transit um, agency created in the 70s along with um, some other systems around the country. Unlike those other systems around the country, did not get built out for a variety of reasons. But really, if you look from a transit standpoint, right, MARTA is the, the heavy rail that helps you travel long distances. The Beltline is part of a larger streetcar network. Uh, so our city council had adopted or has adopted a 50 plus mile streetcar network that is inclusive of the 22 miles around the Beltline, but also includes crosstown connections that connect into the, the Marta Spine, the business um, centers in downtown and midtown, some of the universities. So it's really complementary to Marta. Marta is a key partner um, when it comes to the transit piece, obviously. We're still working through across all the agencies how we do streetcar well in Atlanta, but Marta is very much at the table. And in fact, in November, uh, the city of Atlanta residents passed two sales taxes. Uh, one was a half cent for MARTA that included funding to help build out the streetcar and also included a whole lot of other improvements, infill stations, bus service, et cetera. Um, and there was a separate sales tax measure, uh, four tenths of a penny, that funded a, a suite of transportation projects that included bike lanes and complete streets and all that, but also had a line in there for funding for the Beltline to acquire the remainder of the 22 miles that we don't currently own. So there's still another 13 miles or so that we need to, to buy. Great, great question. So the, the way that this was done intentionally, right, is that this is all one district, right? So it, it is actually a contiguous district. Obviously, it bulbs out in places, but the, the whole theory, right, is that we know that there are parts of the city that have more economic activity than others. This is intended to be a rising tide lifts all boats so that, you know, property taxes that are generated over here by the TAD can be used to build out infrastructure that's going to catalyze development here and at the end of the project we're all going to be better off. Yep. In the back. So I know EDA has been, Economic Development Agency has been involved. Um, I know, for example, they've given uh, a grant that has helped to look at, so down in southwest Atlanta, so the, lo the lower, incomes in, lower income neighborhoods in Atlanta are along the south and west side and the higher income neighborhoods are along the north and east and you can pretty much draw a line like that and look at, look at the stats. So there's a uh, development node down here that they've given funding to help look at how you can build that out to be a jobs catalyst, to be a economic development catalyst. Atlanta, we actually own uh, this old state farmers market site so they're helping to figure out how to develop that. Uh, USDA um, has, I believe, given some, some funding, I know they've expressed interest in helping to think about urban farming on this because, you know, people getting to access to fresh food, I mean, you know, lots of food deserts, um, and so looking at some sites along the Beltline that can be urban farms. 
Somebody else had a question. Yeah. So the, the main points of opposition uh, were you had some there are a few so you had some level of NIMBYism not in my backyard right you know because as I said this is connecting some of the wealthier neighborhoods some of the lower income neighborhoods really for the first time right so there there was some resistance to that although that has that's become a whole lot less pronounced I think as everybody's seen the the benefits um, there has been some opposition. Not so much to the project overall. In fact, I would say that what I'm about to tell you reflects people's love for the Beltline, where the community really wants, has very strong opinions about how the Beltline is built, right? So that can be trail alignments, that can be design, right? Where they may not always agree with some of the decisions that are being made on how to build it. They still love the Beltline. They just want to, they, they want to be, see it, they want to see it be done in a, a way that they want to see it be done. So there's, I'll say, tension, not, not necessarily opposition. Um, another key piece, and this is becoming more pronounced now and is very real, and, and I would advise you all to, to think about this on the front end for any kind of economic development project you do, is around affordability. Right? So the, while the Beltline did have an, or does have an affordable housing requirement, um, the funding for it for reasons I'll be happy to talk about after after the meeting just because it gets into a lot of the weeds. But there was litigation and we had litigation and the Great Recession that severely hampered the tax allocation district's um, generation of funding. And that was the source of affordable housing dollars. Whereas other funding sources came into play to help build what we have with trails and parks and, and other pieces, Atlanta hasn't had you know a lot of affordable housing dollars that's something we're wrestling with as a city right now and as a region and frankly cities all around the country are wrestling with um, but so we're trying to get in place a better policy and funding framework around affordable housing but what you're seeing now is there is the, so the west side trail here which is about three miles is set to open later this year you're already seeing businesses moving in. You're seeing homes selling at prices that were previously unheard of um, in, that, in that area. And there's a big fear of displacement. Um, and, and so that is, you have like, yeah, we love the Beltline if, we're able, you know, if we can still afford to stay in these communities. And affordable housing is a very complicated um, topic. I'd be happy to go into more detail later. But I'd say that's where we're, we're seeing some resistance. And then there's, I'd say also that uh, there are differing opinions about the transit component um, and whether or not there actually should be streetcar in the Beltline. There's some people who are incredibly passionate and absolutely you have to have that. There are others who say, I'm not sure we're ready yet as a city for that. And so there's debate about that. But I'd say at a high level, there's overwhelming support for the, for the Beltline. Yeah, so there were, there were different owners of different, different sections. Uh, so currently, of the parts that we, the parts we don't yet own, CSX owns the, the southern side. They own uh, some of the stretch up here. Norfolk Southern owns a little bit up here. We currently own uh, this piece. GDOT had, uh, Georgia Department of Transportation, had owned the southwest section that they um, did a huge write-off to, to donate not fully donate it, but sell it at an incredibly low price uh, to the Beltline, to different owners. So I'm actually not directly involved in the, in the railroad negotiating side. I will say that I think now that we have the funding through the uh, T-spot, the sales tax that was adopted last year, that those negotiations are much more tangible now. You have a lot more leverage when you actually have money. <laughs> Well, let me, let me take you on a little tour then of the, of the Beltline and point out some of the pieces that we've opened. So the West End Trail, this was actually the first section down in southwest Atlanta. Uh, at this point, we actually didn't own the railroad corridor down there. So this trail was built uh, along existing, existing roads. But it was very important to us that the kind of first stake in the ground was in southwest Atlanta in, in some of the lower income neighborhoods. 
the north side trail. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see here is CSX rail line, that's still active. So there's some areas of the Beltline where, particularly on the north side, where the transit and the trail are gonna run separately. This is one of them, and it's because the freight, uh, the freight train traffic is still gonna be active. These get like 30 or 40 trains a day. Uh, so you can see we get some uh, creativity on how to get under that. This actually runs through a very beautiful um, park and kind of old forest. So one thing that's also important to point out, and I was um, talking, I think, to Ellen earlier this morning about this, that you know the Beltline, it's not cookie cutter around the full 22 miles. Right? We're not necessarily looking to say, well, we got to bring massive development and density to the whole loop. Um, that's not the intent. <laughs> It is very much the intent to identify, and they have been identified, different economic development nodes around the Beltline where it does make sense to concentrate business and density. And then there are also going to be, you know, there are areas of the Beltline that run through single family neighborhoods. And at least for the very foreseeable future, those are going to remain um, single family neighborhoods. And so that's okay that development doesn't happen there. It adds a different experience for trail users. And at the end of the day, the ability for people from all over the city to get to other parts of the city is where, is where the value is. The East Side Trail uh, is probably our, well it is our, our most active piece right now. You can see kind of a before picture, so when the old rail lines were still down in the ground, and then they've been taken up. The, you can see the trail here, this is during one of our races. We do 5K and 10K races uh, throughout the year. And then you can see how we preserve the corridor for the streetcar and the transit to come through at a later time. So it was very intentional to kind of move the trail off to the side of the corridor and preserve that right of way for the future streetcar to, to come in. Southwest Connector Trail uh, is also in, obviously in Southwest Atlanta. A important piece of the Beltline project is in addition to the main 22 mile loop is creating connector trails that make it easy for people who don't live in neighborhoods that happen to be along those rail corridors to get access into the Beltline. And as I've you know, spent a little bit of time yesterday uh, seeing some of your trail network, you know, those, are, those are a very important piece of a, a larger trail system. Right? You, not everything's going to be uh, you know, a thoroughfare and with, with economic development and, and shops and, and apartment buildings along it. You want to be able to bring people into those economic corridors. Right? And so having these connector trails that you know, help bring single family neighborhoods, make it easy for them to not have to get in their car and drive to the Beltline, but to be able to walk or bike from their homes and get to the Beltline is a, is a key piece of it. Yeah. How wide is, what's the surface? I can't tell if that's over concrete. Yeah, so this is, let's see, this uh, trail is, let's say the, the main Beltline trail is 14 feet. This one, because it's a spur trail, I can't remember if it's 10 or 12, I think it's 10. This particular surface in this picture is um, permeable concrete uh, because this, this uh, area that it goes through has a watershed um, quality to it and you have to have permeable uh, concrete as, as the uh, here, but most of the trails are solid concrete. This particular picture because of it's going through a watershed area needed to be permeable. So then we have uh, four and a quarter miles under construction. So we're currently extending the east side trail uh, south about a mile and a quarter. This actually happens to be where our, the Atlanta Beltline Partnership Office is located in this building. Uh, but this will be opening later this year. And then the west side trail. So three miles um, on the west side of Atlanta, also opening up this year. It was interesting with the, with the west side trail, it's going to be our first fully developed trail. So the East Side Trail, which has been very successful, as I showed earlier, 1.7 million people a year, we were still trying to prove the Beltline concept when that happened. And as a result, the, we only had the funding to really build the trail. Because of the success of the East Side and because of the um, opportunity to help improve neighborhoods on, on the West Side, uh, we were able to get a Tiger grant from the US DOT for $18 million that then the Atlanta Beltline Partnership, my organization, we went out and raised $10 million of matching from philanthropic dollars. Georgia Department of Transportation gave at cost the rail corridor. So you basically had all the money to do 
the lights, the access points, so there are 14 access points, there's lighting, security cameras, all the things that we weren't able to afford the first time around on the east side trail that we're subsequently going back and, and putting in. Um, but we're able to do this one right from the get-go. And it's we kind of proved the concept, and now people are willing to invest more. And then another uh, kind of important use is the interim hiking trail. So this is the old rail corridor. It doesn't have the tracks on it anymore. Right? So if we're, where we actually own the corridor but don't have the money or the design done yet to put down the trail and, and layer the transit, we at least want people to be able to use it. And so we've opened these interim trails that are great for walking, they're great for jogging. You can do mountain biking, probably wouldn't take a road bike on it. Uh, but at least still allows people to to move. So this is going um, alongside Piedmont Park, which is, you know, many people say our kind of our, our grandest park in Atlanta. But it goes up to a shopping mall, and it, it helps, you know, when the east side trail ends, the paved ends, you can keep going for another couple miles on the interim trail. And that's been successful. So I wanted to show, I, I, I just put these in here this morning, but as I had some conversations, it sounded like that you all might be interested in how the development alongside the Beltline kind of plays and, and the, how the design happens to help invite people in and, and activate the corridor. So I've, I've put together some pictures that I'll talk through that just kind of show that um, in real life. So this is a new apartment complex built within the past few years. Uh, this is the East Side Trail that gets 1.7 million users a year. This is a connection that was put in, and this is an art piece. I happen to like it, some people don't. Art, that's what art is, right? Um, but you know, this developer paid for this art piece and, and this connection. So it, it gets people out of, you know, these are single family neighborhoods kind of back in here, so you have access coming in, you know, and then multifamily development right up against the belt line with some, some visual interest with art. This is also along the East Side Trail. Uh, this is a historic you know, adaptive reuse development. You know, this used to be loading dock and now is patio for a restaurant. Right? The amount of you know, pedestrian bike traffic that comes into this restaurant is very high and people like to just sit out and watch everybody go by on the East Side Trail. Uh, this is a connection that, again, built by the developer of, of this apartment from a street up here, but his, you know, his folks living here wanted to have direct access down to the East Side Trail. So prior to this, they would have to walk down the street and there was another access point a few blocks away, but this developer wanted to, and the people living in the development, wanted a quick access, so he built this connection. This is uh, the Pond City Market development that I talked about, that old Sears building. Uh, so in this particular case, the Beltline goes over uh, this street, but you can see they built a connection that's both a stair and has a, a channel for cyclists. So in this case, you got a cyclist who was on the street, wants to get up to the belt line. The development built this connection to make that access easy. Uh, same, same development, uh, different, different side of it. Here's the East Side Trail. Uh, during our On the Atlanta belt line, we had this, this is one of the art pieces that was in there that kind of added some visual interest. But this connection, again, used to be where, you know, this used to be the loading dock, uh, but now this is you know, one of the most popular entrances into this development where people can come straight off uh, the belt line and, and walk directly into, into the building. And this used to be where trains would go into the building. They actually had built a spur into it and now it moves people. This is a picture, this is actually not the belt line, uh, but this is a trail uh, called the Freedom Park Trail or Stone Mountain <laughs> Trail. Uh, so Stone Mountain is a big mountain out on the, the east side of the city. Uh, but the Path Foundation, who I mentioned earlier, who's built you know, hundreds of miles of trails throughout the city, uh, they, you know, they do a lot of the type of trail development that I think is most similar to what you all currently have with your, with your green line. <coughs> so this, this is going through Freedom Park. You, know, you can see there's not development along it. Um, I was talking to somebody last night who has a, a brother who lives in Decatur, which is a, a town or city east of Atlanta that's very, a very walkable city in its own right, but it's connected into the city by this trail. And so people can use this to get from other parts of the, of the region, you know, from other cities, into Atlanta. It eventually goes into downtown. Um, 
but it also connects to the belt line. So this trail, Well, I'm trying to fix it. Well, I'm trying to fix this. What I'll say is that trail actually connects into the belt line, and again, it, it's all part of a regional. Okay. So it's all part of a regional trail system. Just from the picture. So basically, that trail that I just showed you, it is going over this bridge. So this is actually a, a um, it's not a highway, but it's Freedom Parkway, which is a pretty heavily used uh, road. And so that trail that I showed you, it's on this bridge up here, there's also a connection that comes down off the bridge, you can see through the bridge, and connects in with the belt line under here. These are people obviously using the belt line alongside one of our uh, premier parks, which I have another picture, it's, it's actually it's on the cover of your overview, overview map. So that picture that's on the cover of the overview map is this park, but filled with many hundreds of people doing yoga. Right, so you, you get connectivity from you know, a different type of trail, the more kind of natural trail, but comes into the very active Atlanta Beltline, connecting people to a park where we have opportunities for greater health. This is also the city of Atlanta's first skate park. Um, so you, you get, a, on a weekend, you get a great mix of activities. You've got skaters, you have families, you know, flag football leagues, soccer leagues, uh, you've got people using uh, the belt line generally and it really just brings you know really just brings everybody together I mean different types of populations that wouldn't all naturally occupy the same space but because we've built the infrastructure and the the public space that encourages them to all come together it really creates a much more dynamic quality of life uh, for for residents and I, I was going to show you pictures of our parks but I'm not sure how to does anybody have any questions while I'm doing this? Generally, the development communities loved it. I mean, it, it is creating lots of opportunities for new development. Um, and so there, ha there hasn't been resistance from the development community. Now, there is because there's a lot of passion within the neighborhoods about what they think, you know, what the neighborhoods want to see development look like. And Atlanta has a process, we have, we have what are called neighborhood planning units, where develop, proposed um, zoning changes and variances and such need to go through neighborhood associations and, and get neighborhood input. There have been times over specific developments where there have been battles, disagreements between the community and the developer that had to get resolved. So, but I'd say generally, developers are flocking to the belt line. In the back. So with the belt line plan as originally laid out, there's a requirement for 5,600 units of affordable housing to be developed as development happens around it. There was, or still is, a um, requirement where 15% of the bonds that are issued uh, from the TAD, from the Tax Allocation District, go into an affordable housing trust fund to help uh, create those, those units. Unfortunately, due to some litigation that tied up the TAD for the first number of years that went all the way to the state Supreme Court, required a constitutional amendment in Georgia to get it up and running. Um, and we got hit by the Great Recession. The TAD has not generated the amount of funding and bonds couldn't be issued, uh, or at least not sizable bonds could be issued. So that that housing trust fund has not been funded to the level that was planned. Right? So there has been affordable housing created uh, but not, we're behind, frankly. So that, that's one piece of the answer to the question. Another piece of it is that affordable, affordability is an issue not unique to the Beltline, right? It's something that as a city we're struggling with generally. We, in Atlanta, we are collectively working on putting in place more robust policies, tools, things like community land trusts, 
financing mechanisms, et cetera, so that we can be better at creating affordable housing. Because you know, some, some have estimated that really in the city of Atlanta, you need probably another 40 or 50,000 units of affordable housing. And right now, we do not have the resources or the policy or policies in place to achieve that. And so it's something that we're all very focused on, but we haven't figured out yet. What dollar amount constitutes affordable housing in Atlanta? Great question. Uh, so two answers to that. One is your typical 60% AMI, 80% AMI, 120% AMI, and it, and it varies. Like if you get, you get different types of incentives depending on how low yeah, in the affordability. I came back from Jackson, Wyoming, and they did affordable housing projects at $454,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> right, I think, I think I, right, I mean, that's, that's a great point. So the, the thing with, I'd say affordable living, right? I mean, you, and if you look at kind of the macro of a city's economy, you want to be able to house your workforce and you want to be able to help care for, you know, there, there are certain kind of special circumstances where you know, people need assisted housing, right? But generally, I'd say you want, to, you, want to have a, you want to be able to house your workforce, right? So there should be a, there's a spectrum of what housing you need and, you know, there might be housing that's affordable to you that's not affordable to the person next to you, depending on what kind of job they have. And so I think part of where we're trying to head and need to head as a city with it around affordability is looking at what's our housing stock, what are jobs paying, right? Who can afford, can the people working in the city afford to live in the city and creating housing at those levels? Well, and, and you want it to be quality affordable housing, right? Because th there are $25,000 homes in Atlanta but most of us wouldn't say that they're, you know, safe and quality and habit habitable. And, you know, so it's, yes, it's all of that, right? And, and you need, again, you need the range. It's not that everybody gets a $40,000 home, but and you need to adjust the size of the home. And it's, all, it's not just houses, it's rental as well. And frankly, a lot of it's rental, particularly at the lower income levels. So. I guess we have one or two more questions. Okay. Exhausted. Okay, I'll, I'll show you some more. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll answer questions if you want. Yeah. So I, I think every community is different. Every community has different assets. Uh, Ryan Gravel, the guy who wrote the thesis, has also since written, written a book called Where We Want to Live, and he's looked at developments all around the world, they don't all have 22 miles of railroad, right? It's, you know, LA is looking at how can they repurpose their river. You've got, you know, Detroit's looking at, well, we've got all this vacant property, what do we do differently, right, to support the future? So I think the, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I'd say, what, what are your assets? I mean, you've got a river, right? I saw lots of rail lines as I was driving around. Um, it looked like on Cumberland, you're starting to do more pedestrian-friendly type development that, you know, or infrastructure that's supporting denser development around it. Um, I, I think you all, I would encourage you to think about, well, what do we have? What can, how can we think differently about using what we have? What types of, um, you know, regulatory framework, zoning, policy, et cetera, um, can you put in place and have a, and kind of have a, have a plan, right? Um, I'll, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, that the Beltline in large part is an economic development process, or project. And it's also a quality of life project, but it's an economic development project. And identifying where Knoxville wants to grow and how Knoxville wants to grow, and then what type of transportation infrastructure do you put in place to help support that growth is really the question. And, Kind of for you. I mean, you all know a lot more about what the opportunities are than, than I do. Because I think people will continue to move to the city, and I expect the Knoxville, you know, the, the country's urbanizing, right? And you all have a, a great university, which I don't expect is going anywhere, <laughs> right? So, I mean, not, I think Knoxville is only going to grow, and so it's, it's really how do you want to grow?
I do. What time is it? Uh, it's uh, 20 till 12. 20 till 12? Yeah. Do you all want to see some of the parks? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Historic Fourth Ward Park, I think I, I've talked about this already. The, the one thing, again, I would say is the amount of kind of intergovernmental and private sector collaboration that happened to, to pull this off has been pretty great. The watershed came together, the parks department came together, we raised philanthropic dollars so that we solved a, a, a water, stormwater issue and instead of doing pipes underground to solve that issue, created a great green space that has spurred a lot of development, has, has become a model and now in the city there are other places that are starting to do this type of of development where you bring watershed and public works and, and parks uh, all all together. I wish I had a before picture, but I mean th this whole area, it was cracked asphalt, burned down buildings, just desolate, kudzu, right? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't imagine what this used to look like. Um, and it's in the last five, five years, five, seven years, just totally, totally transformed. This is the uh, historic Fourth Ward skate park. So you, you've seen this field. This is Tony Hawk, for those of you who might know him. But he actually gave a, he was kind of godfather of skateboarding. He, he gave a, a grant, a small grant, to help uh, build this park. And then he surprised us by showing up to the opening, which we were thrilled. So he just kind of walked up and started skating. And uh, obviously, lots of people were excited. And then, just like a month or so ago, he just showed up started skating, so the people who were using it, it's like, where's Tony Hawk? He's coming back, so he, he likes the skate park. I mean, he, he, uh, he gave us some good advice on how to do it. Another thing I'll mention just about the, the skate park from a community engagement standpoint, so this, this whole site used to be an old um, Cox, so Cox Enterprises, they run the Land Journal Constitution among many other uh, media enterprises. So this used to be a distribution site. This was at the end of a dead end, no, it still is at the end of a dead end street. Old abandoned rail corridor on the other side, hidden from any, you know, anybody and everybody. Well, the skateboard community had gone and, and poured concrete and kind of did their own homemade um, skate park. And it was called the foundation because it was built on the foundation of a building that was no longer there. And there was some tension between the residents and the skaters who would party and skate and drink and other things, but when it came time to design this park, there was a very intentional engagement of the skating community. And one of the skate shops that's kind of the, the biggest one in Atlanta hosted them. There were lots of charrettes that were done uh, with, the, with the skating community, and as a result, this park was designed by skaters, and it is you know, very heavily used. And, and I point that out because a lot of times we think of community engagement from a geographic standpoint, like who lives around this park or who lives around this trail and getting their input into it. Uh, but in this case, it was really like, well, who are the users going to be? And, and how do we design something that they're uh, going to use and they have? Boulevard Crossing Park is on the, on the south side. These are soccer fields. Um, Atlanta's uh, had, we're getting more, but has had relatively a uh, few soccer uh, soccer fields. This is more of an interim use for what's going to be a larger, you know, 20 plus acre <coughs> park. D. H. Stanton Park, uh, also on the on the south side. So this is along a part of the Beltline that we don't currently own. So the Beltline is actually kind of run, running up on this berm here. Uh, but a few a few things that you see in this picture. So these are solar panels. Uh, where we can, we we use solar panels to help offset energy costs. In this particular park, uh, the LED lighting is fully paid for and then some by the uh, energy that's collected by the solar panels. It also provides shade. Uh, you can see a splash pad, which you know in the summer, a lot, you know, a lot of kids love running around in splash pads and you don't need to know how to swim. Right? So from a um, programming of parks, it, it allows for kids to have fun with, even if they don't know how to swim. This park used to be a, a landfill, or illegal dumping had happened. There was actually a little girl who had um, ignited some methane with static electricity when she was going down a slide, and so they had to shut down the park. Um, and then it was, when the belt line came around, we cleaned up all the contamination mm -hmm. and turned what was a park in name only. It was like one lonely play, piece of playground equipment um, into what is now a beautiful uh, amenity for 
one of the lower income neighborhoods in the, in the city. Uh, Gordon White Park is uh, along the uh, original West End Trail, and the trail actually kind of cuts through it. It's a little tough to make out here, but this is one of our Art on the Atlanta Belt Line performances. So this has now become a uh, public uh, space for um, events and, act and activities. So people are here with their blankets out enjoying some of the Art on the Atlanta Belt Line in the fall. And in addition to creating new parks, there are also improved parks. So there are obviously already existing parks that are near the Belt Line. So where we can, uh, where it makes sense, going in and improving existing parks. So a splash pad added uh, down in, at Perkinson Park in South Atlanta. Uh, the second skate park in the city added at Arthur Langford Jr. Park, also in South Atlanta. So really trying to enhance the amenities of, of existing parks that are connected by the Belt Line. And then the last slide I'll, I'll leave you with is uh, the Westside Quarry Park and Preserve. So this is going to be Atlanta's largest park. Uh, this quarry uh, for you know, many, many, many years uh, was granite uh, quarry, but it is now, actually as we speak, being transformed into a 45 acre, two billion gallon reservoir uh, for drinking water for the city. So Atlanta today, um, our, our main funding, our main funding, our main water source is the Chattahoochee River. If something were to happen, Atlanta has three days of water. If things got contaminated, if water flow stopped, et cetera, just three days. This uh, project's going to take that up to 30, so a whole, a whole, month, a whole month's worth. Uh, so it's going to hold a tremendous amount of water. It's going to be the centerpiece of what will be Atlanta's largest park. So again, watershed. You know, public works, parks department, Beltline, all working together to do things in a comprehensive way. Uh, you can see it's no more than about two or three miles from downtown. And to have 300 acres of green space that you would think you're walking through the Georgia mountains, that close to the city center is rare. And uh, we are very excited about, uh, about the, the future development of this park. It will take us at least through 2030. Uh, to do it, we expect just because 300 acres is a whole lot to, to develop. But watershed will be finished with the reservoir in 2019, and then we'll start developing the park after that. Great, great question. So a few different ways. So one is that there is actually a dedicated uh, police unit to the Beltline. Atlanta was successful in getting a COPS grant from the Department of Justice uh, a number of years ago, and then has continued to fund the, uh, the police unit once it, once it got started. And so they're patrolling on bikes and foot, occasionally on horses. They do also have uh, cars, but they're, you know, they're veterans and they love being out there because people love to see them and like, people are so nice on the belt line. Uh, so that, that's one piece. Another piece is through the design. So lights and security cameras, which as I mentioned, we didn't have funding to do those when we first opened the East Side Trail. Uh, all the trails that are being built now do have lights and security cameras from the outset. Security cameras have already been put back in the East Side Trail and lighting is coming uh, by the end of this year. So that's a piece of it. And then just design to, to have good lines, of, you know, good lines of sight, frankly density, right? I mean to have people living and working and recreating um, near the trail is a deterrent, you know, is a deterrent to crime. Um, you know, that said, there have been incidents, not murders, but there have been incidents uh, on the Beltline. It, frankly, there's, the Beltline is safer than the neighborhoods that surround it, but because the Beltline is the Beltline, whenever anything happens on the Beltline, it gets a lot of media attention. Thank you, Rob. All right. Thank you.